So I finished the Breathe Institute course and credit to them, it was an incredible course, uh, really educational. <clears throat> there was a lot of detail in a lot of different areas, but there were a few things that I wanted to share with you. So um, most of the slides you'll see here are credit to them. The first thing I want to explain is why am I getting this specific treatment, whereas other people might get other types of treatment? You know, that might look like maybe some people might get like a tongue tie release. Maybe people don't need double jaw surgery, but single jaw surgery or, um, you know, X, Y, and Z. So for me, I am trying to correct three things. Nasal airflow, palatal tongue space, and posterior airway space. I have known that I've had a problem with nasal congestion, so the nasal airflow part makes sense. Uh, but the MSC is tackling the nasal airflow problem and the palatal tongue space problem at once. And I'll explain how, but um, I wanted to share something really interesting uh, about the nasal airflow problem. So you can imagine that if someone has nasal congestion, like me, it's gonna be hard to breathe through your nose. And if it's hard to breathe through your nose, you're gonna have a higher likelihood of sleep disordered breathing. Uh, but there was actually an interesting component that is compounding on top of that. So Dr. Koppelson uh, taught me about this interesting phenomenon called the Venturi effect. Basically, if you have some fluid flowing through a pipe and then you have a constricted section, that's going to do a few things. The first is it's going to increase the flow rate of the fluid coming through that choke. So uh, a good example of that is when you're using a garden hose and you put your thumb on the hose and you create a constriction, the flow rate increases and the water starts spraying a lot farther. Since the flow rate of the fluid increases on exit of the pipe, there's actually a reduction in pressure in the region with the choke. And if you have a reduction in pressure, you're more likely to get a phenomenon that's similar to when you suck air out of a balloon. In other words, you'll get a tendency for collapse. So if your pipe is very, very rigid, it might be able to withstand the collapse. But if your pipe is soft, such as our airways, then you'll get a higher likelihood of collapse. That means that nasal congestion has this compounding effect. Not only can you breathe less because the space is constricted, but because the space is constricted, the space is more likely to collapse. This collapse can apply throughout your airway, but if it happens at the front of your airway, we call that nasal valve collapse. And that's why you might get certain people getting certain treatments such as nasal valve repair, which is essentially when they just put a rigid piece of plastic or something uh, across the part of your nose that collapses and that prevents your nose from getting sucked inward by the Venturi effect. I think it's important for people to know about the Venturi effect though because again, nasal valve collapse, I think it's typically regarded as safe, um, it's not too invasive, it can be effective, but again, it might be treating the symptoms rather than the cause. It's interesting to think that the cause of nasal valve repair is nasal congestion, whereas a lot of surgeons might think that the cause of nasal congestion is nasal valve repair. And the truth is they're both the cause and which one came first is a matter of your nasal collapsibility and your nasal congestion because it has this feedback effect due to the Venturi effect. So me getting the MSE or MARPI procedure, uh, expanding my palate is going to also expand my nasal aperture, which I explained in one of my previous videos. And that will hopefully help this compounding effect, which is one thing I'm really excited about. Pretty interesting, right? So one thing that the MARPI or MSC will also do is expand my palate giving my tongue more space to rest on the roof of my mouth. And first I'll say why that's important. And second, I'll say what more I need to do after I get the expansion. So why is it important to have 
a proper resting tongue posture. You might have heard this term before. I'm, in a later video, I'm going to explain why having the tongue on the roof of the mouth is imperative for children, but for now, I'm going to say why it's still important for me. So first I want to explain what is proper resting tongue posture. There's a lot of videos that explain it in, a, in good detail. Um, so I'm going to just give you the gist of it. Basically you want a few things. You want the tongue to be resting completely on the roof of the mouth. So that means not only do you want the tip of the tongue here, but you want the whole back of the tongue resting completely on the roof of the mouth. And you also don't want your tongue to be touching any of your front teeth. So you don't want to be pushing your teeth outward. You might have heard why this is important for children. If not, I'll explain it in another video, but you might be wondering, okay, why is this important for adults? So check out this scan of a patient who's on the left has low resting tongue posture and on the right has high resting tongue posture. One thing you might notice is that in the posterior airway, which is, which is the vertical airway right here, simply putting their tongue on the roof of their mouth clears a lot of that width. So low resting tongue posture has the back of your tongue pushing and folding back into your throat, whereas proper resting tongue posture brings it up, which gives you more space. So once I complete my uh, palatal expansion, I will also, and I'm currently doing it now, but I will also need to be training myself to have proper resting tongue posture to really take advantage of all the benefits. And perhaps a narrow palate is one reason why an individual might not be able to properly get their tongue in the roof of their mouth. But let's take a look at this slide which explains all the causes. So the first on the list is tongue tie. You might have heard of this. It's when your tongue is too heavily anchored to the floor of your mouth by way of the frenulum or other tissues and muscles. So patients with tongue tie, they won't be able to get their tongue up properly, resting on the roof of their mouth, simply because their tongue is being anchored too heavily to the floor. So this can be corrected by certain exercises and stretches under the umbrella of myofunctional therapy. There's also a procedure that Dr. Zaghi at the Breathe Institute specializes in and is pioneering called frenuloplasty or tongue tie release. The second is mouth breathing. So if you can't breathe through your nose for whatever reason, you're gonna breathe through your mouth. If you breathe through your mouth, you can't have your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Try it. If you have the tongue on the roof of your mouth and then try breathing through your mouth, if your tongue posture is correct, you won't be able to do it. The second might be tongue tone, simply the muscles in that area are not toned enough to have this proper resting tongue posture. That's another thing that practice and myofunctional therapy address. This next one, tongue space, is exactly my problem. I need to make more space for my tongue so that I can have a proper resting tongue posture. That's what the <clears throat> maxillary expansion is for. The next here is fascial restrictions. This one was really interesting. So what is your fascia? The fascia is a series of tissues that hold your muscles together. And there is one network of fascia called the deep front line that's all interconnected. As you can see in this image of an extracted fascia, there are tissues that connect all the way from your toes all the way up to your tongue. So let's come back to the causes of tongue posture. And I would like to talk about fascia because it's very interesting and I think very important. So this network can be restricted or shortened. And that can happen for multiple reasons. I wasn't totally understanding the reason, so I'm probably gonna butcher this, but from what I understand, if a child develops with low resting tongue posture or low tongue space, the fascia around the tongue might grow to become shortened. And if it grows to become shortened, it might pull on that deep front line fascia network. And when it pulls, it's going to cause your body to buckle. So here's an example, here's an image explaining the po healthy posture 
versus the posture of someone with a restricted fascia system. And here's a photo of me. You can tell that I have really bad posture. So this is something I'm gonna wanna correct for sleep disordered breathing, and I'll explain why in a bit, but also to relieve tension, help with headaches, and help mobility as I age. So back to low tongue posture, you can see now that fascial restrictions might cause you to have low tongue posture. And I think there's a lot of overlap with fascial restrictions and tongue tie. So one thing that is also has a lot of overlap is the next thing, forward head posture. So forward head posture, as you can see in that picture photo of the posture with a person with, person with fascial restrictions might have forward head posture. And if you have correct head posture, then your back of your tongue should ha go up and then resting. But if you're, so it should make some sort of maybe 90 degree angle or so. But if you have forward head posture, then your tongue is going to be lengthened outward and you're not going to get that full tongue on the top of your mouth and your tongue is going to have to travel a lot higher to get resting tongue posture. So forward head posture can also interfere with proper resting tongue posture. So you might be looking at this photo and you might have heard what I've, I've always heard that, okay, this is a photo of a person with forward head posture, rounded shoulders, anterior pelvic tilt. You might have heard a lot that this is due to millennials looking down at their phone or sitting down too much and not getting up and stressed, stretching. I'm here to tell you that that is not as true as it has been made to sound. There might be some truth to it, but I personally believe that the major cause is this. I hope through the next series of videos, as we together learn more about these craniofacial abnormalities, you're going to start noticing what I notice, and this is not scientific whatsoever, but you're going to be looking around, you're going to be seeing people like me, and you're going to see not only do they have this improper posture, but then you're also going to be noticed that the people who have this improper posture, they always have a few key features of craniofacial abnormalities like me. You know, recessed jaw is one of them, but in a next video that's coming out really soon that I'll link here uh, when it comes out, there's a lot more to it. And this was really fascinating. So I, I highly recommend sticking around for that video. So continuing down on the list, we have maladaptive habit, which is just people might have been having low tongue posture for so long it becomes habitual, and then other myofunctional disorders. I don't know what that in case is. So I'm bringing back this photo from earlier when I mentioned the posterior airway space to show why I'm getting the last phase of the treatment, which is double jaw surgery and possibly a genioplasty or genioglossus advancement. This photo is actually a scan of me. You can see that this 7.78 millimeters value, uh, which is the width of my airway down here at the base of my tongue, that's my posterior airway space. A healthy value is more around 11. So I definitely have a smaller airway space than desirable. So bringing my jaws forward will open that up and then possibly a, a, a genioplasty or genioglossal advancement, which is the sliding chin surgery I mentioned, will pull that tongue forward even more. And so with the MSE and then practicing proper tongue posture and the double jaw surgery and possibly the genioglossus advancement, one concern I had that I brought up to Dr. Yoon is with the genioglossus advancement, you're pulling on the muscle in the base of the tongue. And I was wondering if that can also cause fascial restrictions. She said that she wasn't sure, but um, she thinks I'll be okay. But I thought it was an interesting thing. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, let me know. So yeah, that's kind of what I'll be doing for the next few years. Expansion, practicing proper resting tongue posture, and um, then the orthognatic surgeries. And uh, hopefully by then everything will be all dandy and I will feel a lot better, which I'm super excited for. I'll also mention, um, I was told that I'm not a candidate for tongue tie release. I don't particularly have tongue tie, but 
Dr. Yoon said I have what looks like a lazy tongue and also improper swallowing. So I need to look more into this and see how much it's affecting me and what I can really do. Right now I'm hoping that just doing some of the proper tongue posture habits will correct some amount of it, but if anyone has somewhere where they think I should start or comment on how important this might be for me, uh, please share it in the comments. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I highly recommend you stay tuned for the next series of videos as I cover more material from the Breathe Institute course. These should be the most educational videos that I put out. I also want to say that, you know, I have a lot going on right now in my life and I'm putting out these videos. This is actually my second take and I hope that they are getting information out to you, but I think in the future I would like to redo these in a more formal way, better way, and clean these up because I think this information is probably the most important information that I'm going to be putting out.